Good evening. This is Dave Herman. Tonight, DIR presents a conversation with Ringo Starr. Two hours of talk and music with Ringo. It took two years to get Ringo to consent to this conversation. Interviews, he says, aren't things he enjoys. And when you think of how many times he has talked to the press, radio, and TV, one can understand how boring it all becomes to him. Nevertheless, he finally consented with just one stipulation. The conversation had to take place in his European home in Monte Carlo on the French Riviera. I had some anxieties over talking to Ringo, and while flying to France, I couldn't help thinking, will he be cooperative? Will there be some things he won't talk about? Will he be home? Am I taking a 7,000-mile round trip for nothing? Ringo spends about five months a year in Monte Carlo, living with Nancy Andrews, on the 30th floor of a high-rise building built on a cliff overlooking the Mediterranean. Within minutes of my arrival, during an intense thunderstorm which continued throughout the interview, it was he who put me at ease, and I knew my anxiety was uncalled for. For Ringo spoke at length about anything I asked him and more. I've never met a more friendly, honest, and witty man. And as soon as the conversation began, I knew that everything was all right. Uh, yeah, well, I, you see, I don't remember too much of it because, you know, being born, you haven't got such a good memory. <laughs> and I was very small at the time. So, you know, and I was five when it finished. So I don't have no great memories of, you know, bombings and things like that. And some memories I have, I don't have the... I think I've just been told it so often, you know, like where, you know, my mother had me upside down in the coal shed one day when they were bombing, you know, patting me my arse, thinking it was my head. <laughs> she couldn't tell with the panic of it all. She just had me upside down going, go on, be quiet now, good boy, good boy. And I'm screaming because I'm upside down. <laughs> so that's what she tells me, but that's about it. I remember the main thing about the war, I remember, were the shelters in the street. My grandparents had a, the, the government issued you with iron tables, dining room tables, and those, so you could dive under them when they started bombing, you know. And they had that table for a long time. She had a big dog that had a thousand pups under there one day. Probably only had six, but when you were five, four or five, it just seemed like hundreds of little puppies. It was wonderful. And then, of course, the gaps in the street where people used to live, when there was no houses there anymore, so we used to play on them. They were always called bomb buildings. <laughs> you know, brick, bomb building brick site, which they just sort of, they had no time to build them up for years. They're still in England doing them. Um, you know, there would be playgrounds for the kids. What, was Liverpool a big target in the war? I'm yeah, it was. It's, a, it's a port. Uh-huh. And it had, it had, it's got a lot of industry there, M mainly sort of light industry. But the port is the big place. Mm -hmm. That's what they were after. Oh, they had a couple of goals at Liverpool. You were raised basically by, by your mother. Your, your parents split when you were very young, right? Like three years old or something. Three, yeah. Uh, when I was three, my dad left. Um, and so my mother brought me up since then. Mm -hmm. But she went to work all her life. What kind of work did she do? She did anything she could get. She, uh, she was a barmaid. She served in a store, several stores. She went to work in shops and in pubs. Mm -hmm. Did she have, uh, you have no brothers or sisters? I'm the only child. Just you and, and your mom then, when you... Till I was 13. And then? Well, then she married Harry, my stepfather. Mm -hmm. But she knew him before, you know, but... Um, which was the best move she ever made, I think. I don't know why she waited so long. She was nervous, in fact, of what I thought. But she was always, you know, because you get very close when it's just you and your mother. Mm -hmm. You were quoted in the, uh, I guess it was the Hunter Davies book, the Beatles biography, as saying that you learned uh, gentleness from Harry. And you said from Harry you learned that there's never any need for violence. Well, yes. Well, he's a very... Quote, right? Yes, he's a very... He's a gentle man, you know. As well as a gentle person, he's a gentleman. And he's, he's, he's very kind with everybody, you know. And I'm, I'm sure I picked it up. On, I mean, I still like to kick people occasionally, but... <laughs> you know, I did... I know that's one of the... Sorry, one of the great uh, things about him. He's a gentle person. Yeah, well, the, you, you thought of my next question. I wanted to know whether you still feel that there isn't ever any need for violence. Um, 
Frustration. Most violence, I think, comes from frustration. You know, you just get so crazy with yourself. You just lash out or break. I break things more than... Actually, I, I try and hurt objects more than people. You know, I just pick up things and throw them if I get to the, that point, which isn't very often with me because I'm quite a slow person. What are some of the things that anger you a lot? At the time, it's got to be little niggly things. I don't know anything, you know, the newspapers. <laughs> It can be anything, you know what I mean? Just stupidity or things going wrong. You know, and you think something's being done and it isn't, and so you just get nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to uh, early years, right now, um, for a, a good time, you were, you were quite ill. Yes, I was ill. I'm also been told that you came kind of close to death when you were pretty little. Yes, um, yes, very close. Well, I had peritonitis when I was six which is appendicitis gone mad. It bursts. Blood poisoning, actually. Well, it bursts inside your body, and so you, you, your body's just full of this poison. And uh, when I went, went into a hospital, they, went, they operated on me for the appendix, but they were too late. So then the, uh, the famous story is they called the surgeon from the pub next door, and he came in and saved my life. He dived right in there, and he just... I lost a few feet of intestine and a lot of blood, and... They said, well, we've done our best, but he won't be here in the morning. <laughs> to me, mother, so I was fine. And then they said it one other time. And then after six months, I was getting better. I had my seventh birthday in the hospital. And uh, I had these toys and things. And there was a kid, they used to have me in a car, just six and seven. And there was a kid in the next one. I was trying to pass. I had a toy bus. I remember it like yesterday. I had a toy bus I was trying to pass to him. And I fell right out, and so I fell about four feet, which ripped open all the work again. Oh. So they rushed me up again, saying, you know, they're getting sick of this. And they told me, mother, yet again, oh, sorry, we've done our best, but he won't be here in the morning. And here I am. <laughs> they really thought you weren't going to make it through the night, huh? Yes, yes, but I did. And my grandfather, since that day, called me Lazarus as I rose from the dead. <laughs> no one would understand, you know. Everyone called me Richie and Richard. My grandfather would say, come here, Lazarus. <laughs> Uh, too much time for school, so that's one of the plus sides of being silly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, yes, I didn't do much school, and when I did, it was always, um, you were always late, you know what I mean? They'd all been there for a year, you know, you were always last in the class, and, you know, like today, the teacher has no real time to help you out, you know, and I, we didn't have money to get tutors for me. In fact, my mother's friend's daughter taught me how to read when I was nine. And now I can read anything, but she failed to teach me how to spell. <laughs> you know, so I, I can spell some, but spelling, I'm an atrocious speller, but I, uh, I can read anything, it's silly. Me too, I'm an atrocious speller, that's why I went into doing radio broadcasting. You radio, you don't have to spell, no. And I get uptight, you know, with myself, where I won't write letters, because I write frenetically. I write to fr good friends. But I have, you know, a couple of secretaries who do the writing. Because of that, I'm still a bit hung up about it. But it's getting less and less as the day goes on. So, um, not too much school and uh, learning to read. Well, I left school at 13. Oh, really? Besides those years before when I was not there because I went back into hospital. You might as well get the hospital story out the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know, general hospital here, folks. Uh, well, I had pleurisy at 13, which turned into TB. So they put me away again, but in Liverpool, a lot of people had TB. And, uh, you know, they used to just sit in the living room, looking out the window, waiting to die, because they had no cure in 53. They just found the cure, you know, early 50s is when they found the cure. So before then, people, a lot of people I knew just died in the living room. They put them in the bed in the living room, and they would die then. After years of just waiting there, you know, it was a terrible thing, because Liverpool was a, a dirty town. You know, I mean, it was not clean. I always knew I wanted to get out of it. Just somewhere where it could be. So they put me in a greenhouse for another year to fix me lungs up. Well, only one. So now I was very lucky. They caught me right on the, on the edge there. So I just have a piece of lung that doesn't work. I you know I didn't lose a lung or anything like that. So you beat the Reaper twice. Once yes, four times. Well, four times. Well, four and then, times. then it, see, I always said, see, seven is a very big number for me. Seven I was in hospital, 14 I was in hospital, and then at 21 I joined the Beatles, whatever that may mean. 
you know. So seven is very big. In 28, I did the first solo movie. In 35, I got divorced. Uh, so the next one is 42? 42. What will I do? <laughs> <laughs> Leaving school at 13? Yeah. You've got to get a job. You're in school, you go to work. I mean, nobody just hangs around in the house. No, but well, that was also fun. Because you can't get a job in England unless you get a certificate from the school to say you've left. So when I went back to Dinglevale Secondary Modern... What was that the name of the school? Dinglevale Secondary Modern School. Yes, it was secondary modern, the college and nothing. So I went back and I said, no, I'd like my pass to leave. And he said, you were never here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, Who yes, were you? Is yes, that? I was, I promise you. I was here. I was one of your students here. Well, the funny part of that, them not knowing, as soon as we made it, the Fab Four, they had my desk in the schoolyard charging people money to sit in it. With a gold plate on it, right? He sat here, they didn't even know I was there. You know, how things change. So, so then I started work. Like what kind of jobs? Well, didn't do too much uh, for a while, because I just came out of hospital a week before I was 15. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't let me work straight away because you know you have to get better so just to finish the hospital crew off i was under the hospital from when i was six till i was 21 <laughs> and they get, then they gave me permission to leave so i our first job i had was on the railways i was a messenger boy on the railway but that only lasted five weeks because um, you know you have to have a medical to work for the government and they said are you kidding you know when you get out of here <laughs> you know they let you no work they send yeah. you for the medical which was the drag there also the, the other fun part of the railways uh, you thought well i'll get a free uniform you know and i went for mine and all they gave me was a hat <laughs> instead of the whole waistcoat thing so that was a drag then i left there wandered around for a few more weeks and then i uh, got a job i wanted to go in the navy everyone in liverpool goes in the navy you know you go away to sea or well, most of you it's like <laughs> second thing you do we go in the merchant navy and see the world so i thought well i'll do that too i'd like to see the world i always wanted to be a tramp and walk a lot not that i walk now but then i used to walk everywhere <laughs> and uh, so the easy way to get your ticket you know your deep sea ticket was to go and work on these coastal boats for a couple of months and then apply because you get in the union anyway just to go on coastal boats and so i went on there and we used to go to menai and back which is up just around the corner, Wales. You'd leave at 10 in the morning, and you'd be back at 8 at night. And it would take day trippers out. And I worked in the bar there. I was a barman, which was, a, you know, I don't know if you've ever done day trips anywhere in the world. 8,000 people want to drink at the same time, you know, constantly. That's all they do. Well, we're drinking, drinking, drinking. We're on the boat. Let's drink, 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 drink. You know, stagger off. Look at this place. Back on the boat. Drink, 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 drink. It's all drinky. <laughs> Drinking, That's drinking. the whole reason for the trip, yes, I guess. really. So, you know, they all get drunk and have a good time. Because actually, you know, Menai isn't the place to go and sing. All I'm good know. It's well, not... what, what was the ship, and what kind of a ship was it, or a boat was it? Well, it was a, it was a boat. It was uh, it's called the St. Tudno. It was about, you know, a couple of thousand passengers. Oh. You know, it was a big, it was a big day boat. And you served the drinks? You were like a bar, a bar I was boy. A, I was a waiter. You know, you'd go up to the table and say, yes, what would you like? Five gin and tonics, four brown mix, two rum and black and a partridge and a pear tree, and then try and carry all that back to them, to this mad crowd. Hoping for a big tip. Well, your tip would be about five cents. <laughs> they were your tips. Five and ten cent tips, you know, not a, not a heavy spending crew <laughs> on this boat, because we were all keeping the money for the beer. So, you'd met, but I'd still make more on the tips, because, you know, I was getting, I would say the dollar was, it was three dollars to the pound in those days. I was getting, about two pound ten a week, which is, you know, well, you work it out, seven dollars <laughs> a week, and that was a big wage because they pay lads nothing, you know. That was that, that was your weekly win. But the tips you maybe make, you know, three or four pound, you know, the ten cents get that enough. That job only lasted five weeks as well because I went in one morning. See, we had to load the bar in the morning with all the crates of beer and stuff to give out. And I went to an all-night party the night before. I was 17 going to all-night parties, drunk. So I come on drunk and crazy and with my best suit on my big black drape because i was a teddy boy and i wouldn't load the crates so they said well go and see the pets and they sacked me they fired me so that was the end of my seafaring career so we had five weeks on the railroad five, five weeks, weeks on, on the, the boat sea. right so then i'm wandering around again then my dad my stepfather harry knew a man in the pub who knew a man with a factory 
<laughs> you know, so I went to see him for a job as a as a joiner. So get a trade, son. You know, trades were very big in Liverpool. No one still ever are, I guess. Oh, yes, they still are in Liverpool. Get a trade and you'll be okay. So I went down, saw the guy, and he says, "Well, yeah, we'll let you be a joiner, but you've got to go on the bike, you know, the order bike, for a couple of months." I said, okay, I don't mind. It's summer, I'll, tr I'll go around with the bike, you know, delivering small things. So I did that for a couple of months. Then I got fed up with it because autumn was in there and it was getting a bit cold. So I went to see him and said, okay, well, I'm ready now. I'd like to be a joiner. He says, well, we don't need any joiners. Would you like to be an engineer? So I said, okay. <laughs> and that's how I ended up as an engineer. <laughs> I was easy going even then. So I, did, I was an apprentice engineer for four years. Oh, I thought you were going to say for five weeks. No, no, four years. <laughs> but while that was going on, I mean, I had to go to school to learn. You know, I could do blueprints, and I could make you anything out of metal. And we made, you know, swimming baths, um, playground and gymnasium equipment in H. Hunt and Son. Now, but the drag was, when I first joined them, I could get out of bed at 10 to 8 and be in work by 8, because they were just down the road. Then they moved miles away, and I had to be on the bus at 7.30. I never forgave him for that. <laughs> uh, so, so while I was there, that's when I got into music. Were you listening to music yeah. all, all along? This, what kind well, of I first started, I mean, first got into music back in hospital, where else? When I was 14, to keep us busy, besides us knitting and making trays and things like that, they'd once, every so often, they'd have a, a ward band. You know, the teacher would come in, and you'd have drums and um, triangles. And oh, rhythm bands. Yeah. And cymbals and things, but no real instruments, you know, just percussion, it was percussion. So, and the teacher would point to the red dot, and you hit the drum, the blue dot was a triangle. You know, you go, ding, dong, boom, kick, bang. So, and they'd call it music. <laughs> and, but I wouldn't play even then unless I had a drum. I'm going to solve so they ended up giving me drums when they had the band. Uh -huh. And that's when I started. And then when I came out through the work and thing, you know, when I was getting a job, I, I made a kit of drums out of um, biscuit tins, 17-ish. And I put little bits of metal on so they'd ring, you know, and, and I made me on sticks out of firewood, and I'd play like that. Not too much tone difference in these tins, but it was, it was all right. Then, for, for, so I keep translating it, say $5, I bought this monstro old bass drum, bigger than I was. Like what they use in a marching band. Yeah, big, only one skin, tatty as crap, but that was my first drum. So in Liverpool, when they had parties, we'd, you know, you'd have Billy with his ukulele, someone with his harmonica, and Richie with his big drum. <laughs> and because I was a kid, you know, still 17, your, your mother would like, all right, he can have his drum now. So I would bore them all for 10 minutes just hitting this ma maniacal person on a big drum, going, blah, 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 and all, stopping them singing. But they let me do that then. They say, put the drum away, Richie. <laughs> you know, um, but they let me do it. So while all this was going on, in 1958, Christmas 58, my stepfather, his parents were from Romford, which is near London as opposed to Liverpool. It's 200 miles away anyway. Um, he went to see them at Christmas, one Christmas, and they, it's always a friend of a friend, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. A friend of his was, a friend of his friend was selling a kit of drums. So for 12 pounds, you know, he had again $36 at the most. And real old kit, but he had a snare drum, cymbal, bass drum, with a pedal even, you know. I had one cymbal, a snare, and a bass drum with a pedal. Which was a big kit. Man, I was going now, so they brought that back. Um, he brought that back New Year's Day, and in February I was in a band. I joined a skiffle band, and it was great because none of us could play, so no one told each other off. You know, just, yes, I can play, I've got the drums. <laughs> oh, well, I've got a guitar, well, let's form a band. So we all started playing together. You know, just only the guitarist, that my next-door neighbor was a guitarist, he could play. My best friend started playing bass but moved on to guitar. Then we had probably one of the largest skiffle groups in Liverpool at the time because we had a washboard, a drummer, a bass player, and we ended up with three guitars, a front line, three guitar, all rhythm, and one acoustic. We were all acoustic, so one would try and lead, you know. Well, did you play for money? I mean, no. or was it just Oh, not, not too often. Mm -hmm. 
We, uh, there used to be a lot of auditions in those days. You would audition your life away. <laughs> and you would audition anyway just to play, in, you know, just to get up in front of people and play. So you would audition again. Our conversation with Ringo Starr continues now, with Ringo telling us about his days with the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Band. The first playing gig, I'll never forget, and you, no one ever forgets the first playing gig, I don't think. We, sh we were playing the Labour Club in Liverpool. You know, they have the Labour Club and the Conservative Clubs, and they have all these clubs. We were playing the Labour Club for ten dollar and a half each a night. Does a rough translation. <laughs> and, and we never got paid. Man, that was the biggest blow to our lives. We never got our dollar and a half. What? We were booked. We're getting paid. Just we're ripped you off. As soon as you get money, you're semi-professional, you see. <laughs> and we wanted that change. Before we're just bumming around, suddenly we're semi-professional. We're getting paid tonight. Wow, put the tie on. Let's go. And we bought these shirts, you know, looking like a real group. The shirts cost $10 each. We only getting a dollar and a half. <laughs> so we went out. We were, we were going to make it now. And what, he just ripped you off? Well, the guy just was so drunk he didn't pay us. I mean, they whack pay, you kidding me? Well, it's an audition. No, not tonight was an audition. No, not tonight was the big one, a dog and a half. <laughs> We're so, but what a blow to our egos. So, after that, we started picking up money. We'd get a five, ten dollars a night, which was more than we were getting again in the factory, you know, for a week's work. And there were a lot of other Liverpool bands working. Thousands, too. thousands of bands. Everyone, I mean, it's the old joke, you know. Everyone, every street in Liverpool had four or six bands in them. Why Liverpool? Why? Well, I don't know why there. They were just into it, you know. It's a port, and I don't know. I think everywhere else was, but Liverpool, just with us and Jerry and the pacemaker and Silla, suddenly it was a whole Liverpool thing in the 60s, you know. But we were all playing before. Mm -hmm. And we'd have competitions. You'd try and win. We won cups, and you're not too much money yet, but... And we, then we started getting paid these five dollars a night. And, uh, you know, that's how I started becoming semi-professional. That's what they called you. You kept your factory job and you worked at night. Mm -hmm. And you were very tired in the factory the next day. And then the, the next band was? The Dark Town Skiffle Group. Oh, another Skiffle Band. Another Skiffle Band. When Eddie backed you up too crazy. Well, I was playing with, with two bands then. Then I ended up just with the Dark Town Skiffle Band, who were very well known in Liverpool at the time. So I, it was a move move up for me. But Eddie Clayton, we, we were one of the top bands, but I went into the top band. When did Rory Storm come along? Well, that he, was when you really became Yes, well, really Rory came band. while I was with the Dogtown. So <laughs> I'd do a few gigs with well, I auditioned for Rory. That was the joke, and he was terrified with me black drape and this little drum, you know. And uh, what, What's a black was, drape? I mean? Well, it's just a long black a zoot suit. Yes, sure. Long, wide shoulders, yeah. narrow at the waist. Teddy boys. Chair. They were key called chain? in England. Keychain? Well, you had more than keychains. You had belts with, you'd, you'd dry in the buckle, buckle down, so, you know, if you hit someone with it, you'd have all washes all over it, <laughs> and razor blades behind your lapel so no one could grab you. Uh, People would be carrying knives and hammers. There used to be the famous hammer man. <laughs> he used to have, a, just in his inside pocket, this little hammer, so if he goes through, he could go, <laughs> and smash you over the head with it. They were carrying anything. There was a lot of fighting, teddy boy fighting situations going on. We'd play Long it. hair, slick back. Well, all with DAs right. at the back and, you know, Tommy Curtis right. is in the front. So then I went into Rory's group. And we got, you know, the famous Cavern Club, the Rock and Roll Center of mm -hmm. Liverpool. Well, we got thrown off there for playing rock and roll. Because we were skiffle and rock, you know, we were on the borderline. We were the first ones to start moving into just straight rock and roll. And we were the top band again, yet again, I'm in the top band um, with Rory. So, but we did get thrown off the cab. Not many people know that for playing rock and roll. And, uh, and then suddenly I'd done four years. I was 20. And we were offered a job at Butlin's Holiday Camp, which was, we were being paid 16, well, 20 pound a week. By the time of deductions, it was 16 pound a week. Good money then. Great money then. Are you kidding? $50 a week. Great money. So we... But then I had the problem, you say, I had to leave the work, I had to leave the job. Got to be decision-making for full-time. Big either. decision, musician or worker. So I made it very fast. Yes, I'll be a musician. It's more fun, it's better, I like to stay up all night and sleep in the day. And you can meet girls more easily, too, I bet. Well, yes, besides the ones in the office. Who <laughs> <laughs> was something to be believed. <laughs> so, yes. Well, you'd meet them anyway, even when you were semi-professional, because they were always at the dancers. Girls are always the biggest market, you know. They always go and watch bands, and they buy more records than lads. So, 
But you see, it wasn't just... I'd made my decision. I want to be a musician. Right? I'm going to just play in bands. But, of course, the whole family has a say in it. And, you know, in Liverpool, it's a very family-ish thing, though I've only had my mother and stepfather. I had a lot of uncles and aunties and grandparents. And they all, had, they all sat around the table and we discussed it, you know, and how they said... Oh, keep your trade, son, keep your trade. <laughs> you know, drumming's all right as a, as a laugh, you know, but it's... It's a hobby. Yeah, it's a hobby, it's, but it's... How long will it last? We were getting gigs, but was not making no fortunes. Then we were off in Hamburg, which brings us to where I met the Fab Three. Um, in I mean, when you, were in I mean, when you were in Liverpool playing with Rory Sermon, growing up in Liverpool, all the way up to this point, <laughs> yeah. you were not aware of... John and George and Paul and their band. I mean, because no. they had bands, Silver Bullets or yeah, something. Like yeah, that. but no, the, yes, but their bands were crap. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were in these pukey little bands they were trying to form. So you never ran into them or met them? No, or never met them. Well, met first time I met them, they were teaching Stu the bass um, in a club called the Jacaranda. We just got this job to go professional, you know, so, and we had suits and shoes and ties. I mean, we were, we were doing it then. It was like, it's Rory song in the hurricane, look out. You know, so we got this gig, and we went down there, and we were talking, and that was the first time I ever saw them. It was John, it was John and George, and Stu, that's all. I don't think Paul was Stu Sutcliffe, was Stu Sutcliffe. one of the original. Who's now dead and gone, God bless him. So you get to Hamburg, and the Beatles we, were the second band, and yeah. Rory Storm's group, not We were the third no, band third over band. there, right? So we went to see the Beatles, because we, you know, we vaguely knew them just by name. Rory knew them, I think. Rory knew the lads. And they were living in this... Oh, just a pit. It's just a hole in the bleeding wall. I mean, they were just sleeping in there, pretending it was fine. But they were playing, so it was fine, you know. I think that's all we ever thought about. We over. So we then we went to the... They were in one club, the Indra. No, they lived at the Indra. They were playing the Bambi Kino. God. And we were playing the Kaiser Keller. Booked for the Kaiser Keller to take over from Howie. And we went in, Howie's in the dressing room with his band, and they're all on settees and on the floor. And Howie, for warmth and comfort, was sleeping with, and his blanket was the Union Jack. So we thought, we're not having this. <laughs> no, thank you, Mr. Cotsmeter. If you don't mind, we'll walk home. We'll fight you on the bridges. So <laughs> we said, we're not staying here like this. And so we're a big band in Liverpool. We've got suits, and we do a show, and we're OK. And we brought the, our own drums and the guitar. So they put us in the German Siemens mission, all in one room there, but at least had heating and a sink in the corner and a toilet down the, you know, the corridor. So we went and stayed there. And then what Kashmira did, he was the owner of these clubs at the time, Bruno, he, uh, he decided to put both bands in the same nightclub. And Lord Storm's group and, and the Beatles. Beatles. That's how we got to know each other, really. Because uh, we, would, we were there for months and we would have a battle. I mean, because we were both trying to top each other. And they were very big in Germany, you see. That's where they started making it. But the funny thing, even before I joined, when they got back to Liverpool and started making it, people thought they were a German band. Mm -hmm. And girls say, Ooh, John, you don't know how to speak good English. <laughs> Which one of them was it who asked you to join the band? Which of the three? George. George actually did it. Mm -hmm. He uh, convinced the others. The others thought it was a good idea, but... He had more force in those days. The others would go along, you know. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to really break up a good thing. Why did they think they needed a new drummer? Because Pete wasn't very good. Pete Best. Pete Best. I mean, in my opinion, he wasn't very good. Don't sue me anymore, Pete. Well, you must sympathize with a man who was almost... Yeah, well, almost were. <laughs> <laughs> who can tell you right. what would have happened if exactly. that had a gone chemistry is yeah. of four people and that well, is three, right? I mean, no one can tell, you know, what would have happened if this hadn't have happened. Exactly. So, so why did you decide to leave Rory Storm and join the Beatles? What was it that convinced because you? Because the Beatles, I ended up, they were the only band I'd go and watch in Liverpool. Local band. I'd go and watch Little Richard and all, Jerry Lee Lewis and all them, but I would never really go and watch Liverpool bands or them. And usually we were always on the same bill. Mm -hmm. But I used to watch them, and then, then it happened, you know, the old famous story. When, when Pete wasn't well one day, Brian drove up and asked me to play. They got me out of bed, dragged me down to the cabin for lunchtime, and I played that lunch hour, then did the night session in Southport. And just from the lunch hour, we just went and drank till the evening session, then we went and played again, and then we came back and drank again in clubs. 
So I thought, well, this is all right. And we were getting a lot of money then. I got about $25 that day. Hmm. You know, which was, they, they were, that's all they were getting. I mean, none of us were getting fortunes, but $25 a day compared to a week. So the first time you drummed with the Beatles was a, a night that Pete was sick. Yeah, it was the day oh. Pete wasn't well. Mm -hmm. And I just stood in, then I went home, and it was fine. Pete came back the ne for their next gig. A couple of weeks later, he wasn't well again. I don't know what was the matter. I think it was asthma, I'm not sure, you know. So he couldn't make it again. And uh, so I sat in again. And the, 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 the lads enjoyed my playing, you know, because I was a stronger drummer than Pete. Pete, the drag was, though, Pete was like the Jeff Chandler, you know. He was there with the great. Very good looking. And he's there all dark and dusky. And, and the, the <coughs> girls loved him. Oh, they did. He had a big following, you see. He was prettier than Paul. It, <laughs> <laughs> he was. Is well, it, he was more handsome, you know, is Paul it, was baby face. Is it so that when you first started drumming regularly with the Beatles, that the girls in the club in Hamburg would go chant? No, not in Hamburg, you see. You were ahead of everything. Not in Hamburg. It was in Liverpool. Oh, it was in Liverpool. Was well, yeah. I, I knew, everyone knew me there from Rory, and I played with all the bands there. One day I played with every band on the bill, just changing jackets, you know. <laughs> Six jackets I wore. I never got off the drums all night. The curtains had closed, I changed jacket. They'd open, I'd be there again, because just happened the two of the drummers were sick. Just on the one night, so I just played with all the bands. Yeah, I was, well, I was in Liverpool, so now they have had the talk to Pete. So I'm playing with Rory Buttons and Brian Phones on on Wednesday phones. There was a Wednesday and he says, will you join the Beatles? And I said, yes. When? He says, tonight. <laughs> I says, no, I can't do it tonight or tomorrow because, you know, I have to play at least to the weekend to give the guys, you know, five days to find a replacement because the four guys are going to be without a job, you know. They can't go on in the rock and calypso with no drummer playing rock and roll. But you immediately wanted to make the change. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Place. Yes, I said, Brian, I will. Love it. Because it's been going down anyway, mm -hmm. you know, with George and I and John and Paul. We'd all been talking about it, but it was like, well, yes or no, what? Well, I'm getting jolly. And, and we were friendly, we'd go out. Now, I had the car, we'd drive along and, you know, things like that. We'd go out and get drunk together or whatever. So by then, we were very good friends anyway, but they had their band and I was in my band. I'd be, I was away now, play with Portland's again. And so then I, I said yes, and with, then the Saturday night we played at the cavern and half the room went to the left and half went to the right they divided you know because they all knew me and when i sat in it was fine there was never any bother but now i mean it was the biggest news in liverpool you know pete's out ringo's in you know ringo never pete forever it just got crazy out there how and did you feel there. when they would chant that? I mean, did well, I felt terrible. But I had my side chanting for me anyway, so it was up and down, you know. We had all half of these going, no, 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 and the other saying, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, you know, when you're talking about just a local band, really? the whole of Liverpool, like, was stunned for a while and didn't know what to do, and they just got crazy. And then it, they, they said, well, this is it, this is it. You know, there was petitions, and there was yeah, mail, you know, leave the country or you're dead. But it gave you a real indication when this is all going on that the music the thing was happening really yes. oh, tremendously. Yes. Yeah, there was. A, well, you see, I don't know if it was that big or just around the areas we lived in. You know what I mean? Just the area we went to at night. I don't think uh, you know you. They uh, all the people were into it, but it was a very big part of the teenagers' life. Yeah. All the kids were into the music. And know? the next time the Beatles went to Hamburg, you went with them. Yeah, and not Pete. Yeah. Them, that well, I joined now. Mm -hmm. But even then, we were, when we went down in the country, to Stroud or Cornwall or somewhere like that, they'd laugh at us, you see. They would wonder we'd be all up there doing what we were doing, you know. And uh, they, they really didn't know what sort of rock and roll we were trying to play. Well, when did you kind of think that this was going like, to... You had Liverpool and Hamburg also. Yeah. Though. Well, then we thought... Well, we were being laughed at around the country, but we were still doing it and trying. We were picking up... You know, like towns, you know, like you'd pick up St. Helens and Manchester. We took over Manchester. Was it fun then? Oh, it was fantastic. Oh, it was great. All in the van. You kidding, driving for hours and hours in the van, getting out, setting up and playing. And, you know, in a, it's like, because the town's like foreign countries, you know. It's like going to Denmark. If you just went out of your area and you'd have to fight for the audience. Let's go, let's go. I mean, you're going to see, we were nuts enough to enjoy it all. That was what was great. But they were in Wellingtons and... 
you know, because they're all farmers around there. So they were in these big rubber boots, all stomping. And we were on with this, like, um, Scottish um, accordion band. Ooh, they loved. You know, so they're all, you know, stomping and, you know, chuckling with the sheep. And we, uh, we come on playing, uh, you know, some other guy now, sick in the dirt, and they come, and they all go, what? Well, when we could see it, it's not very important. They all come out and say, hey, stop that, laddies, stop that. Give us a blue bleeding, didn't you? <laughs> say, no, hey, Amish, Amish, punch these lads out, will you? We want the accordions. <laughs> you know, when they ages us up there. Well, we came across again, yet again. We in the end, we wore them down. And uh, so, I mean, it was all this, and we're all in a van now, you know, still just traveling all the way around the country, getting to know each other, as well as what we wanted to do, and as well as... Um, and I guess having the together. dreams and the fantasies of, well, we'll get a record, and... Well, Johnny always had it. We'd always say, where are we going, Johnny? He'd say, to the top. <laughs> when our spirits got low, that's what we'd say. Where are we going? To the top, he'd say. Just like that. Um, and, of course, during that period, we made Love Me Do which was just a runaway hit in Liverpool. I mean, you know, just a monster hit. It got into the charts just on the Liverpool sales. So everyone said we bought it in, but it was just all the people bought it in Liverpool because it was the first time besides, well, Billy Fury had made good, a lot of comedians from Liverpool, but not too many musical acts, you know? So we just made this record and they bought it in the charts. And then we took over well, the rest of the world, really. That's how it took over. Um, Oh, well, let's play another record, Dave. Why don't you play uh, Wings for me? <laughs> My Wings, not his Wings, <laughs> off the new album. Wings, the song you just heard will be on... Do you, refer, do you first remember, um, or do you remember when you first learned of Brian's death, of Brian Epstein's death? Yes, we were in Wales. Were you alone or with the... No, Beatles? we were all up there. You were all together? We'd all gone up there to, with Maharishi. We'd found him by then. Well, George and John had, and they told Paul and I about it, because at that time, Maureen was in the hospital having Jason. So, and they'd gone to some, uh, a lecture, and I came back and I had those answering machines, so I, I turned on the red lights on George, saying, well, you've got to come, we've met this guy, and we're going up to Wales tomorrow, you've got to come. Fine, next message, John saying, oh, you've got to come, we met this guy, we're going to Wales tomorrow. So I said, okay. Well, I phoned them up then and said, well, what is it, you know? They said, well, I'll tell you. It's worth seeing. So, and Paul decided to go up too. So we went up just for the weekend, like a seminar for the weekend. And Brian was supposed to come up too. And to see the Maharishi? Yes. You know, because if we were into anything, he'd like to see what we were into anyway, you know. Um, and so we're up there and we're sitting... We'd met Maharishi and done, a, done, the, done the day, and then the next day, uh, there's a phone call. Paul answered the phone, told us, and disappeared. He just, Paul just disappeared. I mean, he told you the news and left the house? Yeah, yeah, he, he left. He left the planet for a while. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it just, we just all were stunned. We didn't know what to do. I mean, Brian, we'd signed toilet paper for Brian. We didn't know what we were into. I mean, but it was, that didn't matter. Because it was Brian, you know, for Christ's sake. He'd been with us all the way. And we all loved him, you know. And he, he you know, everyone felt close to him. I mean, I just talked to myself. I felt very close to him. And he lived above George and I one period. We were, you know. And it was just, <sighs> you don't do anything, you know. You just go, what? So we all got back to London and tried, I mean, we just wandered around for a while. Were there meetings about what we should do now? Well, or? yes, because we were, you know, a monstro act and, not, you know, even Brian's death would not let us slow down. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one of the strangest periods where you thought, oh, well, we should stop for a while. No, no, you can't. You've got to do this. This is sign you've done. Okay, well, who's looking after it? We are? What, we are? <laughs> we were just players, you know. Was there anybody who kind of stepped in for a while Nobody. and took you through the transition? Nobody. No, no one. Hmm? Well, Peter Brown was probably the closest, but he was going through his turmoil as well. Mm -hmm. Did any one of the four of you kind of emerge as a, as no. a bit of an organizer or someone who kept it together at not that point? Not right at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Brian's dead or not, we have to try and, what are we doing with our lives here? And who's going, what's happening? And... S so we were just all in terrible turmoil. We didn't know what to do. And so, it never really did get together as far as 
the whole management thing ever since Brian's death, did it? No. I mean, really solidly. Well, we thought we'll show them. We'll form our own. And we, it was a lot of flower power and grass and acid mm-hmm. in those days. Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, you see, even we had to beg. I mean, we had to beg to get on a label. George Martin, bless his soul, took a chance on us. He did. You know, Brian Hawk, those tapes around... And Decker turned us down for Brian Poole and the Tremlows. But, of course, AMI turned Elvis down, you know. Mm -hmm. So that all went on. But George Martin said, well, I'll do a record with them. And uh, he didn't like me, of course. He He wanted a professional drummer. Mainly because when we did the run through for Please Please Me, and even then we did Please Please Me, I was playing tambourine in one hand, maraca in the other, and the bass drum and the hi-hat. So there's this mad thing trying to shake and hit the cymbals with the maraca. So you go, please, oh, no, that's what we do. How does please please me go? All together now, all you in Radio Land, how does please please me go? One, one two, two, three. three. Said these words to my So then at that, I would smash this big symbol with a maraca, right? And George is looking at me, saying, "Oh yes, <laughs> we've got a mad person here." And so he brought. That's why he brought in Andy White anyway. So you really, you not so all of the drums on "Please Please Me" is not you. Uh, "Please Please Me" is all me. Love oh, me do is not me. Not love you. me do on the single is Andy White, and on the album is me because Andy's doing nothing. I mean, it, I mean, it's a very simple song, you know, so I can do it. But George didn't <laughs> want it at the time. He, he was insecure. He wanted to fetch in a real player. So that, that's the dumbest thing we ever did, you know. He's on the single, I'm on the album. There is one particular Beatle album I want to talk to you about, and then we'll kind of move on to... Well, do you want to know why I'm called Ringo Starr? Well, I do want to know why you're called Ringo Starr. Are you going to come back to that? Let's say it now. Why do you, when did Richard Starkey become Ringo Starr? When Rory Storm and the Hurricanes got the first job at Butlins. We all went there, and in Liverpool, they call you odd names, you know, and I was becoming, I was being called Rings because I had three rings on them. You know, they give you nicknames, Nat, the Hammer Man, this, that. Oops, sorry. Um, Nat, the Hammer Man? Well, yeah, they just give you nicknames or something, you know, Big, Big Arthur and Little Lizzie, you know, anything. So then we went to Butlins, we all said, well, let's change our names. We've gone professional now. Let's change our names. That's what they do. Right, stage names. Right. <laughs> right. So... We had Johnny Guitar, Ty O'Brien, uh, Lou Walters, all took cowboy names. We the only English one mm. to be cowboys. Um, and I took Ringo Starkey, and I said, ah, that's no good, Ringo Starkey. So I just cut Starkey in half and ended up with Ringo Starr. Isn't that wonderful? That's a very terrific story. Here's to you. you. <laughs> <laughs> but people close to you and your friends, and that, they, you're called Richie. Close family called me Richie mm-hmm. or Richard. Mm-hmm. The uh, record now, I want now to every about. now it'll be funny because everyone who wears this, all the people who write will say, "Dear Richard." Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, Ringo Starr might have <laughs> just become more. Richard Starkey right, again. Right. Uh, June second, mm. and I know this because nineteen forty-eight. Uh, uh, no, June second, nineteen seventy-seven. War of China. Two days. No, it's the tenth anniversary <clears throat> of the release date of Sgt. Pepper. June 2nd. In 1967, the album was released. Wow, so it's that long ago. It's 10 years yeah. um, since Sergeant You'll have Pepper. to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an album that, re- that it's, it's a, a landmark album in, in popular music. Yes. What I want to know if you guys knew while you were making the album with George Martin that you were doing something very different, or was it just like another album? No, it was different for us, but it wasn't as different as, a, as we start as... as how we started. We, we started, it was going to be um, Sergeant Pepper. It's, we were going to make, the concept was a live show. And if you listen to Sergeant mm-hmm. Pepper, and let me introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears. I was Billy Shears. Mm-hmm. Uh, which applause, you know, there's all applause. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do a whole show, you know, and here's for the benefit of Mr. Kite and all that. It comes to circus mm-hmm. act. It had this whole concept thing, but it fell apart after track two where we got back to just let's make tracks. Um, and also, then it got into, it was probably the height of all the overdubs. And all done on four tracks? Yes, four track. Four to four to four to four to four. Incredible. But, uh, good engineers in EMI. I mean, they kept that quality up. Tape to tape, we, we lost very little. Uh-huh. You know, and all the, the overdubs. It, for me personally, I mean, it is a landmark album. None of us can hide from that. But it, it's not my fave because we were using each other in a way and being used, you know, where you'd be the drummer on that record, 
and then you'd have all the strings, you know, and I'd want so and so on it, and you know, it was you have I, f I felt more like we were doing sessions hmm. than when we did the White Album, where we were back being a band again, mm -hmm. and Abbey Road, which is my favourite, mm -hmm. and Mine Rubber too. Souls, we were still a band, you know. I mean, that one. I mean, and we were having the last one. Let's put the dogs barking, and you know, <laughs> you know, let's have another. And but the Sgt. Pepper on. album, not only the concept of the album, but the sound of the, the sound of the yeah. record was unlike any music that had been made well, before. Well, yes, like Beatles with the clarity the and what we'd done to it. Yes, yeah. it was a special. It was like a special project, I think. But, but who knew it was going to be Sgt. Pepper? You know what I mean? A little mm. more. Uh, Southern Someone just France won on Thunder. the back <laughs> blackjack table. <laughs> <laughs> or lost. <laughs> or who didn't have money to pay. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> That's how they get rid of their failing to pay their fines, people. It's interesting to me that you mentioned that with the White Album, you were back to being a band again, because I always under, was under the impression that with the White Album, you weren't all working on each track, but that a couple of you got together. To I go left on, on the White Album. I mean, it's like a, a total um, reversal when I say that, you know. But I left on the White Album because I didn't think we were getting on. I thought, those three are having such a good time and I'm just out of it here. I mean, I don't know. I'm not playing well. Nobody loves me. It's terrible. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll leave. That's what I'll do. I mean, that, that took me a few nights, I'll tell you. You mean leave the, the studio? Or leave the band. Leave the band. I was, uh, stayed awake a couple of nights, probably just paranoid at the time, mm -hmm. saying, no, Shall I, shall I? Then I said, yeah, I'm leaving. I mean, I'm just not happy. Why should I stay here? So I went round. It was real funny. I went round. I knocked on Paul's so Paul, listen, you three are so, you know, you're all happy together, and I feel like I'm not with you. And he says, I thought it was you three. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, what? So then... I went round to John. I still carried on. I still thought, well, I've been to all that. No, no, he's got to be crazy. I'm leaving. So I went round to John. He was, he was at my place with Yoko. He just started with Yoko, really. And they were in Montague Square. And I go, Johnny, you three are so close. You know, I feel so out of it. You know, like I'm not with you anymore. He says, I thought it was you three. So I just said, I'm going to Sardinia for two weeks, and then I'll come back. <laughs> I just went away. I thought, well, if it's that much madness, you know, we've got to stop this. But they carried on, and Paul did USSR in the studio. He played drums on that. Then I came back after two weeks. I took the children and Maureen at the time. We just went away. It was out of season. And I came back, and George, yet again, was very good. He had the whole place done in flowers. Welcome back. All these flowers. Uh, wonderful coming back, right? When the Beatles uh, decided to stop working together, recording together, what, was, it a, was it a real tough period? I mean, it's, there's got to be, a, you know, got to be a big crash well, after that kind of a high. You know as well as I do that it was. <laughs> no, it was. I had nothing to do. I sat there. I mean, we'd all decided, which was fine. Then it was like, well, what shall I do? I wasn't writing too many things. So I just thought, you know, I've worked for a few years. I'll just sit around for a while. And I sat around not only consciously saying... Uh, I'll sit round. I sat round, confused, saying, well, what will I do? You know, what will I do? I don't know. I'll sit in the garden. It's a nice day. Go on holiday, you know, just be, think, you know, it's one of those Take situations a nice where long you, think, vacation. you think, well, it may go away, you know, but it never does. It comes back. But you do that periods of your life, say, oh, I can't get into this. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, I can't sit here all my life. I've got to get off my you know, arse and do something, you know. I'll do Sentimental Journey which was that album I did, which was all those songs, you know, all standards of the songs I remembered and loved from the parties when I, they used to let me play my bass drum. Uh, you know, at home, everyone in, you know, in, in the parties in Liverpool, they usually a sing song -y, put your knees up, you know, well, have a great drink. songs, wasn't uh, a Night and Day was Night on and it? Night and Day, Stardust, and, uh, sentimental all journey. the Sentimental Journey, which Richard Perry did. And you had a different producer for each track. Well, I thought album. to make it different, not a different producer, more a different arranger. arranger. George Martin produced it with Jeff Emmerich, but um, I thought to make it a bit different. Now, I can either do them rock and roll, or I can do them like they, sh they are, they're standard songs. But just to make, to give it some edge, I thought, how can I give it an edge? I thought, I'll have a different, so we got basses and ranger. Um, and Paul know, arranged Paul one arranged, of the tracks. He, 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 he uh, arranged Stardust. Because that was that was it was going to be called Stardust, you know, relating to the name and everything. 
But then Richard Perry's uh, arrangement of Sentimental Journey was so good. And it was a sentimental journey anyway, so it took on that, you know, so that's why we changed it. You know, in a, in a real sense, it, you were ahead of what a lot of people have done since. I mean, yes. uh, Harry Nelson did uh, he Touch always of tells in the Night. Ahead. You're and the first was, person. A, Everybody's recording old songs now. I mean, yeah. a lot of people are. Well, that's the problem with being in front of yourself. Being a man ahead <laughs> of his time. You have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving ahead here. Right on there, folks. To Boku's... De blues. Buku de blues. Yes, we did it so fast. Um, and the thing that was wrong with it, I, if anything, was that I'd like to do another country album because I still like country music, and I'd like to do a few I've written. I'm writing more country. I don't know why. There's oh, one nice. beautiful country track on Ringo the Fourth. Ringo then explained in our interview how he got together with the rest of the Beatles and Richard Perry on the Ringo album. I know it just happened. Just happened. That's again why I get taken, please. John was there and George was there. So I go to John and say, Well, I'm doing an album. Have you got any songs? He says, Well, I've got one I'll finish for you. He was in the Beverly Hills with his piano. So he'd had one song. So he finished a song for me. So George was there. I said, George, give us a song. You know, they're the writers. Have you got a song? So he says, Yeah, I've got a song. <laughs> so I said, Well, come and play. He says, OK. And John says, OK. <laughs> So we have the one track with John George and Ringo on it, right? And that track... On the Ringo album. The track is... Don't know. Find it in your albums, folks. Okay. <laughs> I love You it don't know? It. No, I honestly don't know. You don't remember which one that no. was? No. In fact, this is competition time. Get a free T-shirt if you know which track that is. The first five phone calls <laughs> to every station will get a free T-shirt. Um, then I thought, well, you know... We'll get Paul. You know, I, I talked to him as well. So we phoned Paul in England and said, come on, you can't be left out of this. I've got a John track, I've got George's track, and I've got the other two on it. You know, have you got any tracks? He says, yeah, I've got a track. <laughs> so, I said, so I was going to England, so I said, come on, Richard, we'll go to England. So we went to England, and we, we went into the Apple studio there with Paul, and we did, uh, we did his track. So you went all the way to England just to do that no, track? No, not just to do that. We were going anyway. Oh, anyway, I see. That's how that album got together. So and it was the album, like you said, all four of the Beatles were on it, three out of the four in one track. Yeah, three of us were on one track, which was... And we, we, we were like big girls again. We were all looking at each other, smiling, you know, because we hadn't played in four years together. I mean, we'd all said... I'd played on John's album, George's album. This was my first one of those, and they were there, and we were just smiling at each other while we were playing. It was nice, nice. And this is the album that uh, three huge singles out of. Uh, it had Photograph. You're 16. You're 16 and Oh My, oh my, my. my, my. Yeah. That yeah. must have felt real good. It was wonderful. At that point, you see, which was very good for my head, just in the, in the level of the record business, where, because I was always put down as like, ah, not too much of a record talent here. You know, and uh, suddenly we had the number one album and two... Oh. Two number ones and one top five. You have to listen to this program outside in the rain. You have, you have definite feelings about singles. Don't oh you? yes, yes, yes. Well, that's why then we did "Sentimental Journey" in the book. Who's one? I thought I'll just be a single artist. I don't want to go on and do albums. You know, I'm. You know, I was in that frame of mind that time. So I'm not going to do albums. I'll just go and do. Um, I'll just go and do singles. I wrote "Photograph." No, but, uh, back off, I mean. Back off Boogaloo. Back off Boogaloo. I sat with Mark Boland one night, and he was like the original little punk elf gypsy, you know, with the glitter, you know, before Bowie and all those people. He came out fast. So I'm sitting with him, and all night he's saying, oh, back off, and oh, man, it's a Boogaloo. <laughs> and all his little... Uh, is, this, or, is this normal? For no, I've never seen this. I've never known it like this. I'm getting. We, uh, we you brought it with you, oh. so. <laughs> um, you know he's doing all this like. He's saying back off. Back off boogaloo language. So I'm, I went to bed as is you do occasionally, and I woke up and I thought and I had this whole song in my head. I had this back on boogaloo. What do you think you're gonna do? Get yourself up off the. What, what, where's the tape, where's the tape? Because I can't play anything to put it down. And I'll never remember it, you know. I'll never remember it the next one. I run every tape I've got is broken. The ones with batteries are run down. <laughs> the one that you plug in has a fuse missing. 
and I'm hopping all around the house trying to keep this tune in my head, which is turning into Mac the Knife. <laughs> As I'm going along, it's definitely turning into Mac the Knife, and I'm getting panicked. No, no, it's back off. Boogaloo. I'm going on and on. And so I find batteries and I find this tape, so I put it down, and that's how that came about. In, in 10 minutes, I had the whole song. Just 10 minutes. So I did the single with George. I said, come on, let's go in and do a single. I've got this single I want to do. Because George and I were... It was, we were always close, you know, with different ones, twos or threes. It was always a circle. At that time, it was George. So, and he was very good. He'd, you know, he'd produce them. So, and it came about, the riff we have, because I still think it's one of the strongest tracks I ever did. Mm -hmm. We were talking, we were doing it, and it wasn't working, you know. You, and anyone who works in a studio will know that feeling. It's not, well, something. And George said, well, what about some sort of, like, boom, boom, boom. Bam, bam, ba bam. That was George's idea. Bass drum riff, right? He wanted the bass drum like boom, ba boom, 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 ba boom. And I said, yeah, yeah, okay. And I just started going, rum, go, go, on the snare drum, you see. So I said, yeah, well, let's get it like, boom, boom. So I did it on the snare drum. The whole track just fell together. As soon as I started doing that march, like boogie march on the drums, it just, I'm just keeping it four, four on the bar, you know. Before it was getting, it was a bit too light for, you know, it was like, back off, boom. We're suddenly back off, boom. Then, of course, we get to Goodnight Vienna. Right. Which, which gave us the No No song. Right, which was and another what? magical experience with Hoyt Haxton. Loved the song, loved what it was doing. I mean, it was such a good song for me, you know, that real. But comedy, you know, mm -hmm. no one believed it at the time. Great lyric. I mean, good yeah, lyric, right. good lyric, good attitude, makes no sense. Good song for me. You know, I've never... Uh, I... We are safe here. No, no, I don't. No more. I'm tired of waking up on the floor. I never woke up in my life on the floor after that. <laughs> good. So, um, you know, he turned into the no-no, so we did Good Night Vienna. We had a couple of other songs. But... Also, what we must never forget to mention is, on the Ringo album and the Goodnight Vienna and every other album since, the guy I work with, Vinnie Poncia, mm -hmm. who I write with, and on the next, the new album, we wrote more together than we've ever written because we're getting to know each other a bit better when he's awake. Um, so Richard was working with Vinnie, or Vinnie was with Richard, something, and he put us both together, which was probably the greatest thing he ever did in my musical career. Richard, thank you. So... Just to get Vinnie down. It's time for a change, I think, you know. And you can't get a reef to produce you unless you're signed to Atlantic, which is not the reason why we signed. So I met a reef. A reef Martin. A reef Martin. Uh, he came to London for five hours to have a chat, and I, we sat there and talked. And at the end, of it, I said, Well, I'd still like to work with you. And he said, Well, I'd like to work with you. And we said, OK, and we we'll did it. We did Brody Give Your, but I, I made him come to LA. And we were still getting to know each other in a way. Um, and he didn't know the players there. But I, I mean, I, it, it, it turned out fine. The next, this new one, Ringo the Fourth. Which will be soon coming to your neighborhood records. Store. Right. As, and it's us knowing each other better. And me coming to New York, which was most amazing, because I hadn't been for four years. And then to be thrown into the middle of these, this band that I didn't know any of the players, never played with any of them, uh, was, I mean, it, there's a lot of adrenaline in New York. New York is totally different from L.A. I mean, as everyone knows, unless you live in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, I don't know what, that's just such a nice word, Wisconsin. No offense, Wisconsin. Um, you know, and it was January. Well, we sort of got rid of Roderick of Yore in the way. Uh, you know, we did in L.A. There's not much I can say about Rotogriv York. It was a good meeting place for Reef and I, and a change of label, uh, you know, and a whole... It was time for me to move on. That's what it was. Somewhere else. I didn't know where. I went around a whole stack of houses again and ended up where I did. Well, and if my opinion matters at all, two great, great tracks on Rotogriv York. Hey Baby and Dose of Rock and Roll. I know, but you see, I had complete faith. You know, we were talking about... Pick the singles. I was very good at singles. I thought Dose and Rock and Roll could not fail. I thought so too. And Hey Baby, I mean, are you kidding? And they did nothing. I mean, they did. You see, I'm too, too crazy now because if it gets into the top 40, you know, people beg for it to get to the top 40. Well, I get annoyed if it's not number one. If I put a single out, I only want it to be number one. There's number nowhere else to go. Number three is no good. No, number three is, is okay, but it's not number one. I want number one, because that's the game. I'm not going out there to be 49th. Mm -hmm. 
if I want to do that, then I'll, you know, I'll do something else. Play rugby. My game. Rugby. Or, uh, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> football. <laughs> chair, a, chair a rugby team. Play musical chairs. Okay, you know, I mean, when I put it out, I want it to be number one. Mm. Otherwise, there's no point. And I don't know, I mean, I'm pleased you like those two tracks, because I love them. I could not believe why they didn't do it. Just something, which is also is why I like the game, the, the rock and roll game, where you don't know. After all these years, I would not know what a number one is. I think I know, and I put records out, and they end up they're not. You know, something happens, I don't know. Now, on the new album, I'm told, is going to be a great old song. Yeah. Drowning in the Sea of Love. Drowning in the Sea of Love. Just, put a, just off the wall, so here's a single. You know, Drowning in the Sea of Love. We've got other singles on there. Mm -hmm. One is Wings, which is stands a good chance, I feel. Mm -hmm. Which is one Vinny and I wrote. Nothing to do with Paul and Linda. Um, but, you know, we had the meeting at Atlantic, and, you know, and they're all there saying, well, got to push the album and you got to do that. You know, it's the economics of the whole situation. You happy with the album, though, the new one? This album I'm very happy with. This one, more than Rota Grivio, I'm happy with. Okay. I think it's stronger. I think it's stronger because Vinny and I wrote six tracks. Um, and so I know those songs better, you know. And I've got one last kind of obligatory question, which if I didn't ask you, they would stone me somewhere along the way. Well, line. we're not getting together. Well, I wasn't going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you whether it's something that you would like to someday happen in your life again, to just get... to work, whether it's one day or one week, what? with John and Paul and George. Would what? that be something you'd yeah, like to happen? I, I could enjoy that. But you see, people, for that one day, you have to give up six months of your life. And uh, right now, and I can't see in the near future, the four of us are prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have no um, qualms about playing with the other three. You know, they're good players. I'm a good player. We had a good band. And we can, do, we can play, you know, if we want to. But right now, I don't want to. I don't know about them. I don't want to. Does it surprise you that the Beatles just don't ever die? That it's as strong today yeah. as 10 years ago, and well, maybe we'll listen, go on. they're still on. selling more records than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Do you th I mean, it's uh -huh. the phenomenon just goes on goes and on. Goes on and on. Yeah, well, because, you see, including ourselves separately, uh, none of us have done anything really as good as that. It's the, the whole doesn't equal the sum of the parts. The whole is greater than the yeah. sum of the parts. Yeah, there was five of us in the whole. You know, besides the four of us, there's whatever else was going down. And what it meant at the time, and even for kids who weren't around at the time, the legend is just being spread over them by, you know, the grown-ups. They say, oh, you should have heard them, you know. I'm sh it's like your dad saying, oh, Benny Goodman, now there's a band for you, you know. And that's what kids are getting out now, the Beatles. See, I loved uh, the Times. They did a survey with 10-year-olds, and besides one of the kids said, this is the English Sunday Times. One of the kids said, oh, they're all dead, aren't they? Another kid said, didn't they used to be Paul's backup band? <laughs> and uh, another one said, well, me, I think my dad knows them. I got me, a new one for you. But, well, this is true because a friend of mine overheard an eight-year-old say it. Do you know the Beatles? And she said, no, I don't like classical music. Wow. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what she's saying. Yeah, so far, you see, it's time. It's time. Well, they'll never rest just like, you know, Benny Goodman won't rest or Glenn Miller. They're always there, and the music they did is very good. And it holds up, and so does ours. But sometimes it gets in the way of our individual lives. Mm -hmm. But also, you have to say, what well, it lets us be individual like this. It lets us do whatever we want to do because of that madness that went down, you know? I'm not playing little clubs anymore. I can stay in the south of France if I want to. I don't miss a bus. And buy my own bus if I want to go on a bus, you know. So it, ga it gave us a lot, and we lost a lot, which is always the way. You know, and, it must be a good, mm -hmm. and it must be a good feeling to know that you were part of a contribution that so many people I'm always of pleased I was on. part of that situation, you know. But, I mean, not some days I feel, ah, just let it be me, you know. I want to be me, but I'm me and part of that. I'm used to it now, I don't know. I'm used to it. Thank you, Ringo. Thank you. You've been listening to a conversation with Ringo Starr.